I uh, want to bring to you something here uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to read to you verses 13, 14, and 15. Then, then I'm going to talk for a while, make some general observations, then we're going to come back and really take a look at this text. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 13, 14, and 15. Father in heaven, I'm so grateful for this opportunity tonight to be here among my brothers and my sisters. And that's what we are, Lord, we're family. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that you, as a faithful shepherd, would come right now and feed us, your sheep. Feed us by the word of God, by the work of your spirit. We pray that here this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now, one of the most common questions I've been asked is, is this my first time to Kensington? And it's not. I mean, it's at least my third. Maybe I've been here four times. First time I ever came here was when our brother from Calvary Chapel, Philly, Timmy Patrick, came, and he's giving me a tour of the city, and he said, I gotta show you Kensington. So we came, and we saw. Second time when I was here last year, and it was a wonderful time again. And the third time I'm here, so I don't think I necessarily regard myself as an authority on this neighborhood, but let me just say, this city is a mess. It's a mess. Now, it is not because people here in Kensington or similar neighborhoods are more fallen than anywhere else. They're not. Listen, I, I live in Santa Barbara, California. And to me, I think about it, it's hard to think of a community that in some ways is more opposite than Kensington. Now, I only say in some ways, because we have our homeless out on the streets, we have our drug addicts, we have our gangs, we have all those things, and our church deals with them a lot because our church is in a section of town where there's a lot of homeless roaming around and, and we are right across the street from the city's rescue mission. So we deal with that a lot. But in a lot of ways, the image, the, the, the outward veneer of Santa Barbara, it's a resort place, it's a vacation place. Cruise ships dock off and people get off the cruise ships and go around our town and it's beautiful and the movie stars and celebrities and things like that. And I gotta admit, it is a beautiful place to live. But the people who live in Santa Barbara are just as fallen as the people here. In a lot of ways, they got more money or more of a support system around them to kind of cushion that. But they are just as fallen as people anywhere. And I wouldn't say at all that the people here are more fallen than anywhere else, but because of the concentration, there are more fallen people in this city. It's just kind of a matter of the concentration of them. I mean, that's what cities are, right? Cities are where people come together in a more heavy density. You're not talking about a village. You're not talking about a small city. You're not talking about rural America where people are all scattered out. You're talking about cities where lots of people come together. And I want to tell you something. I mean this with all my heart. And I'm saying this as a Bible man. God loves cities. And he loves cities because he loves people. Now, I know we all have our preferences. Some people are city people. Some people are country people. All that. We all got our preferences and that. But... I don't want anybody to forget the fact God loves cities. I tell you, the scripture that came to my mind, and I'm not going to preach on this because I was strongly tempted to preach on this passage because this is a passage that comes to my mind when I think about this. I think of this from Mark chapter 9. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Wow. Wow. Isn't that what you see in the eyes all around? Weary 
and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. But what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus had compassion on them, and he said, send out laborers, and he preached the word to them. That's what it says in Matthew chapter 9. He brought the word of God to them. Now I want you to think of something else too. God loves the city, he has compassion on the city, and God's destiny for his redeemed is a city. Do you realize that? The new Jerusalem is urban. <laughs> let, let me read this to you. I'm not making this up. Revelation chapter 21. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Do you know what that means? That, that means that the most beautiful thing that John could think of was, and in that culture it was just thought, the, 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 the pinnacle of beauty was a bride on her wedding day. We kind of think the same way, don't we? That's why you take all those wedding pictures and put them on the wall and all that. We, we think that's the pinnacle of beauty. That's what John compares this city, the New Jerusalem, to. It, it's, it's a bride in her glory. Going on, he says, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he'll dwell with them forever, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and shall be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. But brothers and sisters, that's in a city. Now, it's a city, meaning people, and lots of people. The New Jerusalem is a big city. But, but, it's the new Jerusalem where God has remedied everything from the fall and lifted it up even higher to give us that status that's even higher than innocent Adam will be redeemed men and women. It's a holy city, a new city. You look around here, you don't see a lot that's holy and new. Although, I'll say that again, I do see a lot. I see in here holy and new. Isn't that what's holy and new in this community? God's people are holy and new. On the outside, in the structures, in the needy people around, you don't see much of that. But, but it also has continuity with the past. It's Jerusalem. It's the new Jerusalem. And again, I just want you to understand, it's significant that God describes this piece of heaven as a holy city. Cities are places with people and people interacting with each other. God's vision of heaven to us, as he describes it, is not some lonely cabin out in the country. Now, I don't know, there may be a space in heaven for people who want the lonely cabin out in the country. I don't know. But God doesn't tell us about that if that's there. What does he tell us about? He tells us about a city and a city that he loves. So the Christian concept of heaven as a city, a place of life and activity and interest and people. Listen, this is not the Hindu conception of some kind of blank nirvana. This is God fulfilling everything because man has never known community unmarred by sin. I don't know how long Adam and Eve had it in the Garden of Eden. But even if they had it for a long time, it was just the two of them. Mankind has never known real community that's been unmarred by sin. But, but, God promises, I'm going to bring it, and you're going to see it perfected in the new Jerusalem. Now, we got problems when believers expect to have that kind of community right now. Because it's not going to happen. How many of you come to church and you, you got to realize I'm not in the New Jerusalem yet? All right, we get that. Or there's problems when we fail to understand that that kind of community, ultimately, it only comes down from heaven. We can't create it. We don't build it from the earth up. It comes down from heaven. But John says this is going to happen and it's going to be God's gift. Now, that's God's ultimate destination Praise the Lord for it. But I got a question for you here now. How are we going to reach this city in front of us? Whatever the city in front of you is, whether it's your local place, 
this right here, how are we going to reach it? And by the way, I so appreciate what Pastor Craig had to say about making the priority reaching the city instead of serving the city. Now look, when we were out walking around today, and listen, you should have been me today walking around with Buddy Osborne. That man's like the mayor of the city around here. It's beautiful. It's just wonderful. And listen, it's just, I, that, that's the most pleasant afternoon I've had in a long time. So, but, but I walk around, and every place we saw the different teams doing their thing, you guys were serving. But here's the thing. You weren't only serving, you were reaching. You were serving so as to reach. Reaching was the real goal. And, and if not serving would have better facilitated reaching, you wouldn't have served. If serving would have better facilitated reaching, you'll serve. It just doesn't matter. The goal's reaching. And that's what I saw out there. Now, how are you going to do it? What's going to drive you? What's going to compel you to do it? Because listen, we all have to be compelled by something. No shortage of compulsive people in this world. All around us, you see compulsive people. There's compulsive gamblers, compulsive drinkers, compulsive addicts, compulsive eaters, compulsive spenders, compulsive thieves. No shortage of compulsions. Now, not every compulsion is a bad one. You ever feel like you're compelled to read your Bible? I just got to read my Bible. That's a good compulsion. You ever feel compelled to worship God? That's a good compulsion. Feel compelled to give or to serve? Those are wonderful, godly compulsions. That's what Paul's talking about. Let's read it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Now, do you know what that means to be beside yourself? It means to be crazy. Matter of fact, that's right. I, that, I knew you guys could relate to that right here. Jesus was more than once in the Gospels accused of being crazy, beside himself. And Paul, on more than one occasion, was accused of being crazy, beside himself. When he preached before the Roman official Festus, that magistrate cried out saying this, Paul, you are beside yourself. Too much learning has made you crazy. Now, by the way, I have met some people like that. But that wasn't Paul's case. But that was an unbeliever saying that about Paul. I want you to notice, these were believers who thought Paul was crazy. Believers thought Paul was crazy because he was too out there, too on the edge, too committed, too compelled to do what he did. And listen, I'm looking up a room full of people who may face the same accusations. You got people who don't understand what you're doing? You got people who's hesitant to really get behind it and lay, oh, this is a good thing that you'd give your life and, and work so hard to do that kind of ministry? Listen, you're in good company. They thought Jesus was crazy, they thought Paul was crazy, and they think you're crazy. Now, he says, if we're beside ourselves, note he says, it is for you, or excuse me, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it's for you. We'll give our crazy self to the Lord. We'll give you our sound mind. But now verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us. Brothers and sisters, just that phrase right there. Paul says that he, now I want you to notice, he says us. He didn't say me which means it was true of Paul, but it was not only true of Paul. We don't stand back and say, that's Paul, it's not us. No, he uses the word us. This is something for Christians to grab onto. This is something for you and I to say, what's going to motivate us to serve the Lord in whatever way he's called us to serve him? I'll tell you what it has to be. It has to be the love of Christ compels us. That's it. That's what motivated Paul. That's what pushed him on, the love of Christ. Now, what does it mean when we say the love of Christ? Right, I can think of three ways to understand that. And I want you to know, I don't think all of these three ways, I don't think that these three ways are contradictory. I think they're complementary. I think every one of them can be true, although I do believe there's something of a hierarchy. 
So I'm going to present them to you in the hierarchy that I put them in. I'll put the lesser than the middle than the greatest last. Because that's what preachers do. They save the best one for last. So that's what I'm going to do. The, 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 the lowest, the middle, and the, but they're all good. And I think they're all valid. What does it mean when we say the love of Christ compels us? Okay, number one, we can think of this in terms of the love that Jesus gives us for other people. That's the first way. The second way, the love that we have received from Jesus. That's the love of Christ as well. But then we could say, it's also the love, and this is the third one, the love that we return to Jesus, that we give back to him. I mean, after all, if I say the love of tacos compels me, I'm not talking about the love that tacos have for me. I'm talking about the love I have for tacos. So, I mean, I think you could validly understand this three ways, but let's explore these three aspects. First, the love that Jesus gives us for other people. Listen, this is something for every believer to experience, especially in the neighborhood. Listen, Jesus gives us love for the unlovely. Are, are there some unlovely people that you meet with in this community? Probably. Now, we are able to love people that we previously were not able to love because Jesus gives us love for other people. And I hope you experience that. He gives us love for the sinner. He gives us love for the leper. He gives us love for the weak. He gives us love for the strong. He gives us love for the low class. And let me tell you, he gives us love for the high class as well. He gives us love for the addict and for that hipster poser. No, the love of Christ compels us. And we remember, though, that when we do God's work out there, we have to do it with the love of Jesus filling our heart. Your resource of love is not adequate. You cannot make it. The love that you can drum up within yourself through your own enthusiasm, your own efforts, that is never going to do it in this community. You'll burn out pretty fast. But listen, the love that Jesus gives you, because I believe this, don't you? Have you experienced that? That Jesus gives you a supernatural love for other people? Listen, if we ask him for it, if we wait on him before it, if we in faith we receive it from him, Jesus will give us a supernatural love for other people. And this is what we have to have. Now, I would say this. We always remember what love is. You know what love is? Here's one definition. I don't know if you can define it just from one way. What is love? Well, one way to define it is love is desiring and doing the best for others. Not necessarily giving them everything they ask or want. When you give people things that are very uh, harmful to them or that they're going to use for harm or, or that just enable them in a, uh, in a uh, disgraceful, depraved path, you're not loving them. Matter of fact, you're probably just doing it to make yourself feel good. Pat yourself on the back. No, you've you got to really love that person and say, I am determined to do what is best, to desire and to do what is best for that person. Not necessarily just what they ask for. You know, love and niceness aren't always the same thing. Now, I pray that God makes us nice. We should be kind people. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. We're never going to be, but, but I think there's this weird thing in our culture today that love and niceness are equated. Sometimes love has to be very direct and a little tough. Well, sometimes more than a little, but that's love. Now, I want to emphasize it again. Your love will run dry. Your love is exhaustible, but the love of Jesus is inexhaustible. If you are compelled by the love Jesus gives you for other people, you're going to have 
the compulsion you need to do the work that you do. All right, that's the first aspect, the love Jesus gives us for other people. Okay, what's the second aspect? I would say that it's the love we personally receive from Jesus. That compels us. Listen, do you know what it's like to be loved on by Jesus Christ? Do you know something of when Paul says that, that the believer knows that the love of God, and I just love this phrasing, even though it, it's a little far, but it's, I can't say it has been shed abroad in our hearts. I don't even know exactly what that means, shed abroad, but it sounds awesome. It just means that we know if we are the children of God, there's something about it that, that when, listen, a lot of us grew up in homes. Maybe, maybe you didn't have it working right in your home where you had a mom and a dad that loved you. Or maybe you, you did have a mom and a dad or one or the other that did love you, but maybe they could never really say it. There's a lot of that in a generation ago. You know, I, I, I know my dad loved me. I do. I grew up in a loving home, but I got to say, and I, I don't mean this as any criticism of father at all, but I never remember as a boy hearing my dad say that he loved me. Now, God's doing a wonderful work in my dad over many years, and he says it to me a lot now. But I don't even remember as a boy. But, but at least I knew he did love me. I, I didn't grow up with that insecurity. But I'll tell you this. Not only does God demonstrate his love, he tells us it again and again. Do you know what it's like just to receive the love of Jesus? Now, if you don't, I just want you to know, I think this is your birthright as a child of God. As a child of God, it's your birthright for you to know that you are loved by him. And I don't know how he'll do it. I mean, there's an aspect of this that is something of a spiritual experience. And I can't replicate my spiritual experience in your life. But I would just say, if you don't really know and sense and, and have that wonderful, yes, he does love me. He cares about me. I have Jesus' love. I have my Father in heaven's love. If you don't have that, I think you need to get on your knees before the Lord and say, Lord, this is my birthright as child of God. Do whatever work in me you need to so that I can receive this. I mean, I just think that's how the Lord works. You see, we have a sense here from Paul that he had to do what he did in ministry. Don't you think Paul felt like giving up many times along the way? Did you like when Pastor Buddy read that thing from 2 Corinthians talking about all the beatings and everything that Paul endured? You've got to imagine, probably after shipwreck number two, he felt like giving up. Maybe after the second time he got beaten with 39 stripes, he felt like giving up. I mean, over you think so many times, Paul said, no, but you know, he felt compelled. Do, do you know that feeling that says this? I can't do this any longer, but I also can't not do it. I got to do this. You're just compelled. And that's not necessarily a bad place to be at because you're like at the end of yourself, but, you know, but still, I have to do it. The, you know what you're experiencing? The love of Christ compels me. Jesus, you love me so much. Paul was compelled by the love Jesus gave to him to serve others. And I'll tell you what. When you walk in this love, it keeps you humble. You see, you walk around and I don't think this happens much with people like you. I don't. But I need to speak to it. Because even in small places where it might happen, it is so poisonous that even a small bit of it needs to be spoken to. So please don't think like I'm trying to throw a blanket over the whole group here and say, oh, this is all of you. No, th th this may be rare, but wherever it exists, it needs to be challenged. And what I'm talking about this is a sense of pride in thinking you're better than the people out there. Now, if you have a profound sense of how Jesus has loved you, you, you know how unworthy you are of that love. We are. This is his grace. It's his undeserved favor. You don't deserve it. You could never deserve it. I, I hate to break the news to you. He does not love you because you're so wonderful. That's not why, I, I mean, that's how some people almost take it. I mean, there's this bizarre twisting 
deceptive work of Satan that kind of says, man, I am so great that even God loves me. (laughs) What kind of madness is that? Listen, his love doesn't say anything about my greatness, but it says everything about his greatness. And when I receive that love and walk in it, I have a humble heart towards all my brothers and sisters. I just realized, here we are, we're just, we are unworthy recipients of his love. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. You, you don't look at that other person, well, you know, you need to know Jesus loves even you. <laughs> and it's like, oh, Jesus, would you love even me? And let me tell you, if you ever want proof for the love of Jesus, you need to look to that proof, look for that proof, to the cross. The Bible tells us that the cross was the ultimate demonstration of God's love. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The ultimate demonstration of God's love is in the past. He loved you, and it stands forever in all of eternity. Now, I don't mean to deny that God cannot give fresh evidences of his love. Praise the Lord. He gives them to us all the time. But there is no fresh evidence of his love that could ever be greater than the ultimate that he did back at the cross. Sometimes when I pray for people, especially when I pray for people for healing, I'll pray something like this. I say, and Lord, I pray that you'd heal my sister not to prove to her that you love her because you prove that once and for all at the cross. I pray for her, Lord, that you'd heal her to give her a fresh demonstration of your love. Listen, nobody needs to doubt the love of Jesus Christ. Look back to the cross. Look to your own unworthiness. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, this is a foundation for ministry of wanting to give something to others Because Jesus Christ gave us everything. Isn't that it? When we really receive the love of Christ, it touches us and and it makes us want to reach out and touch other people. All right, that's the second one. The first one, the love Jesus gives us for other people. The second one, the love we receive from Jesus But here's the third one, that we can say, the love of Christ compels me. It's the love that I have for Jesus. The love I have for him. Look, let's face it. People will do things for love that they would never do for any other reason. Uh, A a guy I know, and I see him from time to time. He's a friend, but you know, he's one of those friends I only see two or three times a year, and but I'll follow him on social media. And all of a sudden, I notice, following, look, uh, the, the guy's a good-looking young man, you know, probably in his mid-20s, late-20s. Good-looking, talented young man. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not trying to be critical of the guy or anything, but, you know, he just had, let's just say, a very casual appearance. You know, hair all messed and shaved, half-shaved, clothes, just kind of whatever, this or that. You know, and I mean, just kind of normal for a young man, nothing unusual, but just, just kind of that, you know, I don't really care all that much about how I look, kind of look that young men have. Then I started seeing on social media, all of a sudden, the guy's looking sharp. Shaved, his hair's all nice. Man, he's dressed up like this. And then, and then I said, instantly I knew, what had happened? There's a woman involved right there. And then in a short time in his social media, what I see, I see a, I see a very nice looking woman right there with him. Now, first of all, I'm really happy for him because, man, this is great. And I hope it works out with him and that gal. But it just reminded me of that principle. Listen, we will do things motivated out of love that we won't do for any other reason. It is. And probably everyone, you got some crazy story about something that you did for love. The, the love of a spouse, the love of a potential spouse, the love of a child. For heaven's sakes, love of a pet. You've done crazy things. We will do things for love that would not motivate, nothing else would motivate us to do it. Do you see what a powerful motivation this is? To be able to say, Jesus, I love you so much that, that I'll do this. I'm happy to do it. 
And I can't get away from that scene with Jesus talking to Peter by the Sea of Galilee in John chapter 21. You know the one I'm talking about? What did Jesus give him as a motivation for ministry? If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, hey, isn't that weird? Wait a minute, Jesus, if I love you, shouldn't I be doing something for you? And he says, yes, you should be doing something for me. Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Feed my sheep. By the way, isn't it wonderful there that Jesus emphasized twice the feeding of the sheep and once the tending of the lambs? You, you could make that analogy right there to the kind of ministry we do in our cities. Our, bi- our double priority is to bring them the word of God and Jesus the word. That's our double priority. Our single priority is to tend them, to take care of their practical needs. Yes, we don't ignore that. But listen, our double priority is to feed the sheep, bring them the word, bring them Jesus the word. But isn't that interesting? When Jesus speaks to Peter about his motive, he says, Peter, listen to me. If you love me, serve. If you love me, reach. And this might be the greatest compulsion. If we want to reach the city because we love the people in the city, that can run out. But if we want to reach the city because we love Jesus, that never has to run out. Now, every one of us is aware that our love for Jesus isn't everything it should be. If there's someone here who really thinks that they love Jesus perfectly, then either you're a little misguided or you're like crazy proud. (laughs) Because none of us do. We all fall short in our love for Jesus. Every one of us can and maybe even should love Jesus more. You say, yes, David, I want to love Jesus more. How do I love Jesus more? I'm so glad you asked that question because the Bible tells us how. It is not by trying to work it up in yourself. I need to love Jesus more. Oh, I need to love Jesus more. All right, I'm going to try. I'm going to love Jesus more. I'm going to love Jesus more. I, I, I'll start abusing myself. Oh, if I, fastings will make me love Jesus more. Don't fast to love Jesus more. There are other reasons for fasting, but don't fast to love Jesus more. Oh, that all-night prayer vigil will make me love Jesus more. No, don't do an all-night prayer vigil to love Jesus more. There's great reasons to do the all-night prayer vigil, but not to love Jesus. Did you know the Bible tells you how to love Jesus more? I want to tell you a verse, and you know this verse. You know this verse so well that I'm going to say the first part of the verse and you're going to say the second part of the verse. Ready? This is how confident I am that you know this verse. It's from 1 John chapter 4. We love him because... I've got a bunch of Bible geniuses here. This is amazing. You know that, don't you? Listen, that is such an amazing principle for building our love to Jesus. You want to love Jesus more? Stop trying to love him more. Stop beating yourself up for not loving him more. And just put your eyes on Jesus and receive the love that he has for you. We love him because he first loved us. And when we think about the greatness, the glory, when you think of how wonderful and amazing the love of Jesus is for you, it will spontaneously make a greater love for him rise up in your heart. When you think about the fact that Jesus loved you when you didn't think about him at all, when Jesus loved you when you were sexually immoral, when Jesus loved you when you were getting drunk and getting wasted, when Jesus loved you when you considered yourself a brilliant atheist. Remember that? You were such a fool then. Jesus still loved you. 
Jesus loved you when you were wasting your life. Jesus loved you when you laughed at Christians. Jesus loved you when you were high. Jesus even loved you when you were a proud Pharisee. Jesus loved you when you were right at the gate of hell. That is amazing love. That is love that compels us. Brothers and sisters, if we want to be compelled by the love of Christ, we need to grow in his love and we grow in his love by fixing our eyes on Jesus and receiving and meditating on his great love for us. It's a beautiful cycle. Now at the end of it all, i just say this. Paul was compelled by the love of Christ. The love of Christ was in his heart for other people. The love of Christ was something that he received from Jesus, but the love of Christ was something that he gave back to Jesus, and he reached a needy world because he loved Jesus so much. Now, if you are not compelled by love, what is going to compel you to do what you do? That's the question that scares me. I mean, because what... Are the other options so bad? You better believe they are. You know, guilt compels a lot of people in ministry. Guilt is a terrible compulsion. It's a terrible motivator. A desire for prominence or importance motivates some people in ministry. It's a terrible compulsion. Some people are compelled into ministry by somebody else. It wasn't really their idea. But a parent or a sibling or a spouse, they pushed them into it. Some people are compelled into ministry out of some desperate desire to make God love them more. Listen, if that's any of you, this is a warning sign. This is the dashboard light blinking at you. This is dangerous. Your engine is about to seize up. Stop now and let your compulsion change. No matter how you got into ministry, maybe you started doing what you're doing under under three different bad motivations. And maybe you realize that. Maybe the Holy Spirit's shining that light on you. I've been motivated by bad things in the past. That's okay. Right here, right now, before Jesus Christ, say, Lord, change my compulsion. Change my motivation. I want it to be, I am compelled by the love of Christ. Lord, just like you compelled Peter by the love of Christ, that's how I want to be compelled. You see, the Apostle Paul himself knew what it was like to do ministry from a different compulsion. Listen, all those years he was a Pharisee and persecuting Christians, wasn't he doing what he thought was ministry? But under a very different compulsion. When his motivation became the love of Christ Everything changed. You look at that person who is bitter and cynical and frustrated and resentful in ministry. Think of that person right now. Even if it's yourself, is it possible that they are truly motivated by the love of Christ? No. It just doesn't work that way. In the end, It's only ministry that is compelled by love that truly glorifies God. I I pray that the Lord would make that true of all of us. I want to be compelled by the love of Christ. Don't you? Father, this is our prayer. Lord, I pray that you would gracefully and gently, but thoroughly, Lord, cleanse us of impure motivations for ministry. Lord, they don't do us good, they don't glorify you, and they don't ultimately serve the people we want to reach. But Lord, right now, we just lay it all before you and say, Lord, we believe that you can, that you can cleanse us from any aspect of impure motivation for ministry. And Lord, bring us back to that simple statement The love of Christ compels us. And Lord, if it means people think we're crazy, then Lord, so be it. Do it among us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.